Maine rates highly as a treasure hunter state with a variety of sites. Almost all of its beaches have stories of pirate treasure, and there are numerous tales of pioneer, Indian, and early bandit sachets within the state. There is an unusual treasure that probably still waits where it was stored, about 10 miles southwest of Portland, Maine, waiting to be found. To some people, the idea of searching for Egyptian mummies might be sacrilegious. But remember, the mummies have already been taken from their original graves, transported to the United States, and are worth on today's collector's market in excess of $12,000 each. Here is the story. In 1857 and thereafter for several years, newspaper publishers in this country faced a severe shortage of rags, which was necessary to add strength and body to wood fibers used in paper sheets. As the shortage of rags increased, large numbers of small newspapers went out of business. Augusta Stanwood, a printer in Portland, Maine, was greatly affected by this rag shortage. Realizing that he would go broke, Stanwood looked around for a much-needed source of this ever-increasing shortage of fiber. One night, while drinking ale with a sea captain, Stanwood told him of his troubles. The sailing captain suggested using the cloth wrappings of mummies. At this time, the Egyptian graves were being exploited, artifacts, coffins, and mummies were being sold by the thousands throughout the world. Stan Wood made a deal with the ship's captain to obtain several dozen of these cloth-wrapped bodies. When the shipment arrived, Stan Wood stored them on his property in pits to preserve them, about 10 miles southwest of Portland. During the next three to seven years, he used about half of the mummies, putting their linen and cotton wrappings into paper grinders. This pulp made a very good grade of paper stock. About this time, the rag shortage led up. The cause of the Civil War and the capture of the huge stores of cotton by the Union forces throughout the South, thus Stanwood did not need to use the rest of the mummies. After he tried to sell them in cotton, Stanwood left the mummies in the pits he had dug on his property. After Stanwood died, few people even remembered the mummies. And they are as far as can be learned still buried on the old Stanwood property, about 10 miles southwest of Portland, Maine. If you aren't afraid of ghosts, this unusual treasure would be worth thousands of dollars today. The stories of treasure that were supposedly buried by Captain William Kidd are so numerous that it would be a waste of time to try and investigate them all. I will give the site near the state of Maine, where Kidd is rumored to have left part of his ill-gotten gains. I make no attempt to estimate the value of each treasure, but will give the names of the different islands Kidd is supposed to have visited. You will have to do the local research on these different locations. The islands are Oars, Outer Huron, Squirrel, Mohegan, Hallwell, Pitson, Isle of Hoot, Tuba, Oak Island, Deer, and Bailey. These two instances of treasure being found in Maine lends credence to the fact that more is probably there. Jewel Island in Casco Bay is supposed to be one of the places where Captain Kidd buried treasure. Whether or not Kidd ever visited the island is unknown, but there is a story backed up by considerable evidence that Captain Jonathan Chase found a large treasure on the island, killed his helper, and buried him during the recovery. No record of what happened to Chase or the money can be learned. On Bailey Island, also in Casco Bay, there is a well-authenticated story of pirate treasure actually being found in the 1850s. A farmer named John Wilson was duck hunting on the island when in an attempt to retrieve a fallen bird, he slipped into a crevice between two ledges. In his scramble to climb out, he uncovered an orange pot with pieces of Spanish gold. He exchanged these for $12,000 in coin of the realm, a comfortable fortune at that time. A story of possible treasure on the Alagos River, which would be worthwhile to check out, is that of Ants Hanley. During the early days of timber cutting, the lumber companies were constantly in trouble with squatters. These people would carve out a small homestead on company land, then hint to the owners that if they were forced to move, a forest farm might start that would destroy millions of dollars worth of timber. In most cases, the squatter stayed on the property. One such land parasite was Ants Hanley. About 1900, Hanley came to Fort Kent, accompanied by his wife and two children. 
After obtaining supplies, he moved up the Alagos River in Aristotle County, where he squatted. During the next few years, Hanley engaged in making whiskey for sale to the loggers. It was said that if his homemade product, that if a man could drink it and come back for more, he would live forever. Hanley also sold farm products and engaged in smuggling whiskey, guns, and cigarettes from Canada, which he sold to American sportsmen and hunters. When Hanley died, he left a rumored $60,000, some of which he had hidden before his death and could never be found. Local research could help on this. This information can be helpful to the Maine rock town interested in searching for rocks or gems. In Maine are found ores of most metals as well as useful non-metallic minerals such as quartz, feldspar, mica, graphite, and the gemstones such as formalite, berlin, and amherst, garnet, and topaz. This state has yielded the finest emerald burial ever found in the United States. In mineral production, Maine stands about midway among the states, with the annual yield being valued at about $6 million. One-third of the state is unexplored in respect to mineral resources and only limited areas have received adequate investigation. Platinum has been reported, although the possibility of obtaining it for commercial use is not yet clear. Gold is present in small quantities in a number of places. Silver is found in most of the lead and zinc localities, and the copper ore at Blue Hill. That are of considerable bodies of lead and zinc of definite value have been known since they were first mined in 1860. Some pure silver has been mined at Sullivan and elsewhere. The locations of different mineral sites can probably be obtained from the State Geological Department at Augusta, Maine. Maine rates highly as a treasure hunting state with a large number and variety of treasure sites. There is hardly a beach along its coastline that has not at some time been connected with tales of buried treasures. The following locations and stories could be worthwhile to investigate. Cliff Island was once the home of a tough old savager called Captain Keith. He lived alone in a log hut on the island. His favorite way to wreck ships was to tie a lantern to his horse's neck, then ride up and down the shoreline. Ships at sea would be misguided by his light and would be wrecked on the reefs and ledges that surround the island. Keith would kill any survivors of the wrecks, then salvage the cargo. In those days, while it wasn't encouraged, illegal savaging was condoned, and no questions were asked when someone sold salvaged goods. Keith is supposed to have made a fortune in his occupation. There is a place on the island still known as Keith's Garden. Local stories tell that somewhere on the island, a part of Keith's money is still buried. This is quite possible, since he had no family and lived alone, with very few ways to spend money, as the wrecked ship supplied him with most of his needs. The Great Chibiqui Island, reached by ferry from Falmouth to Portland, is the second largest Casco Bay Island. In the 1860s, an old sailor said that in his pirate days, he had been one of a pirate crew which many years before had buried a great treasure here. He began digging in a secluded part of the island. A young islander offered to assist him. When the offer was refused, the islander leaped over the rope which the old man had enclosed the spot where he was digging. Whereupon the treasure seeker, in a voice quaking with anger, cried, I call on God and you people to witness within a year this young fool will be tied in knots, even as I could tie this rope. No one remembers now whether any treasure was found, but a short time later, the young man was soaked while fishing. He was confined to his bed with an agonizing malady, which drew up his arms and legs as if tied in knots, and when he died soon after, it was necessary to break the bones of his limbs in order to get his body into the casket. The story of two pirates, Bellamy and Williams, 1716-1717, has been written before, but my version comes from a book dating to before 1900 and contains information which I have not found in any other publication. It was not at the mouth of the Matias River where the two pirates had their stronghold, but further upriver. They did dig a subterranean house, but it was not inside the fort. There is little doubt but that the vault holds a large hoard of what we call treasure today. The story of Bellamy and Williams started out as what could have been just another instance of illegal savaging in the West Indies. After several years of wrecking ships from the shore, the two men decided to try it at sea by becoming pirates. Now for piracy, they need a ship which they did not have. But the problem was shortly solved with the appearance of a British merchant vessel 
Whiter, near their headquarters. To Whiter, her holes bulging with precious metals, ivory, and gems, took shelter in a small West Indian cove. Here the British proceeded to replenish their water supply before starting their long voyage to England. A few hours later, the land-bound pirates were rowing towards the unsuspected ship. In a matter of minutes, every member of the crew was dead. Bellamy and William immediately commissioned the water as a pirate ship and headed north. After looting a number of ships along the way, the pirates arrived at a destination selected by Captain Bellamy, the only navigator on board. The spot was near the mouth of Machias River, far from any civilized community at that time. It was here that the two leaders put into action a plan that they had for some time. They reasoned that the cargo which their ship carried should be hidden before they sailed again. The two decided to build a permanent headquarters, which took the form of a large log fort with defensive fences and earthworks. Close by, a large vault was excavated to serve as a treasure house. Here the spoils of their pirating was secreted. When all of this was done and the water had been overhauled, Bellamy and Williams set sail again. For several months, the pirate deeds were the byword from New England to the Carolinas. After several forays, the treasure house was filled. So extensive was the wealth that Bellamy and Williams decided they could afford to quit pirating. However, the temptation to make one last trip was too much, and on the last trip out, near disaster occurred in the vicinity of Fortune Bay. The pirates spotted a wealthy-looking vessel, which, when they were within range, was a French corvette with 36 guns. In the battle that followed, most of the crew of Bellamy and Williams were killed. Although the battered water had managed to elude the French vessel and sail back to the pirate headquarters, when the water was repaired, they again set sail on that one last trip. Near Nantucket Shoals, Massachusetts, the pirates captured the Murray Jane, an outbound whaler from New Bedford. He carried nothing of value. Bellamy appointed the Murray James captain to lead the water through the unfamiliar shoals until the tip of Cape Cod was passed. Then Bellamy himself would navigate. The captain of the Murray James, straightened his way through the reef, led the water around, and the pirate vessel was torn apart. All the men on board both vessels were drowned, except the captain of the Murray James, who finally made it to shore. Several pirates who were following the two vessels in a small sloop also reached the shore but they were swiftly captured and hanged by the angry townspeople of East Ham, Massachusetts. The headquarters of Bellamy and Williams near the mouth of the Machias River has just disappeared, but somewhere nearby is hidden one of the richest pirate sachets in North America that has never been reported found. This short story has a mystery concerning a treasure location that has never been reported solved. Outer Huron Island, Maine, lies a few miles offshore from Booth Bay Harbor. Around 1900, two young men came to Outer Huron Island from New York. They had a map of the island showing where a chest of pirate gold was supposedly buried. The two never revealed how this map came into their possession. With a specially constructed auger that could be lengthened indefinitely by adding sections of iron rod, they started boring near a lone spruce tree on the highest point of the island. After a month of constant work and at a depth of 30 feet, the auger brought up oaken chips. They penetrated this, and the bit came up with particles of what seemed to be gold. The two men hired two Italian laborers and excavated a 30-foot shaft. At this depth, a 6-foot oak plank was found, and that was all. The gold had come from a copper spike which the auger point had rasped. The mystery is, how did a copper spike and a six-foot plank get 30 feet underground unless some kind of excavation had been done years before? No report of any treasure found in this area can be located. One of the few instances of counterfeiting in Maine was done on Ragged Island in Cumberland County. One gang operated for several years until they were finally routed by federal agents. This island, because of its isolated position, was also a rendezvous for different lawbreakers for several years. This little-known location could pay off because it's almost certain that something was hidden by some of these outlaws. This little-known treasure was found by accident and then lost again and has never been refound. Manana Island is off the middle coast of Maine. Around 1900, several fishermen stopped their boat at this island to relax. They decided to play a game of soccer. 
When a wild kick was made by one of the crew members, the captain of the group ran to retrieve the ball. As he picked up the ball, he noticed rusty metal sticking out of the sand. He dug the sand from around the object and saw it was an old pot filled with coins. Since he was out of sight of his crew, he stuck the pot into a nearby rock crevice, intending to come back for it later. After playing for a while longer, the crew went back to their fishing boat. The captain made an excuse to stay behind for a short time. Returning to what he thought was the crevice where he put the pot of coins, he was amazed that he could not find the right one. Deciding that part of the coins would be better than none, the captain called his crew and told them what he had done. The entire company spent several hours in search of the coins, but were never able to find them. As far as it is known, somewhere on Manana Island, stuck in a rock crevice, there's a sachet of coins waiting for a lucky treasure hunter. Crawford, in Washington County, once the center of extensive lumber operations, was the scene of many stagecoach robberies. Favorite yarns of early stagecoach travel told of how, when deep snow impeded the progress of the coast, packs of wolves would follow the wheel tracks and were warded off only by the alertness of the drivers and the quick cocking and firing of hand-loaded and primed guns. Other exciting tales around this region. One concerns three brothers living near Bangor, who was highwaymen and terrorized this district, stopping coaches several times a week and extracting all valuables from the passengers and their luggage. It is told that a passenger who had been robbed while traveling through the area Several months later in Boston, recognized a man lounging in a tavern as one of the three bandits. Accused, the man shouted his innocence, but a gold nugget hanging from his watch chain was found to bear the initials of the coach passenger. It could only pay to do local research on this game. Here is a treasure lead in Maine that, to my knowledge, has not had too much publicity. It is based on legend, but don't let that bother you. Legends do come true. The legend states that Indians under a Captain Sunday mined silver near the town of Cornish, Cumberland County. The place was marked by three small hills flanking the Saco River near its junction with the Ossipee River. The mined silver was stored and never used. After working the mine several years, the Indians sold the land on which it was located to William Phillips, who spent the remainder of his life searching for the mine, but never found it. I have no way of knowing whether there is any truth to the story of treasure on John's Island in Casco Bay. Many stories cling to this little island, which is famed by being the summer home of the Lauder family and Gene Tunney. Tradition has it that there was a large frame tavern on the north end of the island, a hangout for seamen. One of these was a Portuguese who never did any work, but always had plenty of gold and silver to spend when he appeared from parts unknown. This went on for years. Finally, he died in a foreign land, but before he breathed his last, he gave his friend a map of John's Island, showing the location of a hidden well near the tavern. At the bottom of this well, he said gold and silver would be found, because I helped put it there from the pirate craft Daredevil, commanded by Dixie Bull. Searches have been made for this well, but without success. Somewhere in the mountains of southwestern Maine in Oxford County, there exists a mother load of gold beyond the wildest dreams of any treasure hunter. Pure conjecture? Not at all. The statement is based on solid facts and research. For 50 years, concentrated efforts have been made by professional geologists to find the source of gold in Oxford County's brooks, lakes, and ponds. The precious metal is found everywhere, and platinum occasionally. At the present time, research is continuing in the Wilson Mills area, very close to the New Hampshire border. There is very definitely gold in them Thar Hills, especially in the region of Eustace. Near Bryan, the Swift River and its many feeders have produced more gold than all the other main regions combined. Anyone who can handle a pan will find small traces of the color if he's willing to spend the time. As many as a dozen persons can be seen panning the streams on a given day. A few do their prospecting by searching behind the upturned stones and boulders where small nuggets sometimes collect. Fly fishermen will often set aside the rod and search for gold, perhaps attracted by flittering glint. Trappers have been finding a small amount of gold in the Swift River almost since the area was opened to settlement.
Within recent memory, over $7,000 of the yellow stuff was taken from among a jumbled pile of rocks at a bend of the river. Pearly Whitney took several thousand over a period of years from one of the branches. Two Boston vacationers panned almost $500 in two weeks' time from one of the small brooks that flow into the Swift River. Northwest of Bryan is the Wrangley Lake Chain, a popular vacation area in the Northeast. In Nile Brook, not far from the village of Wrangley, both platinum and gold have been found. All of the streams flowing into the lake contain the precious metal. In any few, a number of freshwater pearls have been found. But it is in the area, extending from the village of Eustace southward to Lake Parmenici, that causes the excitement among those who search for gold. It is generally believed that the mother load is somewhere in this general area. Kibby Brook, which flows past the village, has produced some outstanding crystals, as has the Malagoy River, southwest of the town. Trappers often find traces of gold while running their lines. Remember that you're in a region that even prominent scientists believe harbors a fabulous mother load. There is nothing mythological about the gold of Maine. Somewhere beneath the sea, in Penobscot Bay, Maine, not far from Vinyl Haven, lie the charred remains of a size wheel of royal tar and her treasure chest of $35,000 in gold and silver. The 164-foot size wheel or streamer was a new ship. Having been built the previous spring of 1836 in St. John's, New Brunswick, truly a show place on the water, she was often considered the sturdiest and safest craft on the run between Maine and New Brunswick. It was a small wonder, therefore, that a circus returning to the state after a highly successful summer tour of New Brunswick should charter the Royal Car for the voyage home. The circus was so big, however, that the streamer was almost too small to hold her. This necessitated the removal of several of the Royal Tar's lifeboats in order to fit the troop aboard. The removal of the lifeboats was to have fatal consequences later in the voyage. When the side wheeler sailed for Portland, Maine on October 21, 1836, she rode low in the water with her decks crowded with huge cages filled with horses, camels, and other circus animals, including the show's headliners, Mogul, the gigantic Indian elephant. When the circus wagons and other gear were added to this, it should have been plain to all the vessel was overloaded. But in spite of her tremendous cargo, the sturdy Royal Tar encountered no major problems on her journey down the coast until the unexpected happened. As the streamer lay at anchor about two miles off the Fox Island thoroughfare in Penobscot Bay, disaster hit without warning. One of the boilers became dry and quickly overheated, causing the wooden timbers to burst into flames. Whipped by winds of near gale force, the fire grew with lightning and intensity until it was beyond control. The flames raced at will through the overcrowded decks of the anchored steamer. Realizing the fertility of the situation, Captain Reed immediately ordered the lifeboats filled and lowered. Seven hours after the fire began, the Royal Tar sank beneath the waves. It is estimated that in the meantime, she had drifted some 20 miles as the captain had pulled in the anchor. What is interesting to the treasure hunter, however, is the fact that $35,000 in the pursuer's safe was untouched by anyone during the fire. It is understandable that all concerned had to abandon the ship too hastily to think about saving the money. At least, this was the report of all those questions following the disaster. So the treasure was still on board the Royal Tar when she sank, and the facts seem to indicate that it is still there on the bottom of Penobscot Bay. One of Maine's little-known treasures concerns Jim Dolliver, a wealthy sawmill owner who secreted $42,000 in gold for safekeeping between the forks of now Manchester and Murphy. He had previously made an overland journey to Montreal, where he had converted all of his notes, checks, shares, and bonds to gold sovereigns. He liked the feel of gold rather than paper. During his journey home on the Old French Trail, Dolliver saw some half-breed Canadians skulking behind him. Were they going to rob him? Would they kill him? As Jim tore through the dense woods to evade the real or imagined robbers, he went completely insane from fear after hiding his money in an old stump. Relatives later stated, that Dolliver died battling imaginary thieves. These same relatives offered three quarters of the money to whoever would find it and spent $3,000 in efforts to discover its whereabouts to no avail. As far as it is known, this sachet has never been found. 
The little town of Liberty, Waldo County, also boasts of a lost treasure of $70,000 in gold coins. This trove belonged to Timothy Barrett, who lived there in the early 1700s. Folks noticed that Barrett always seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of money, although he never worked. Was he a retired pirate? The explanation seemed to satisfy his neighbors. In time, the old fellow became vexed with people always asking him about the source of his wealth. So he moved across nearby Georgia Stream and dug a cave for a home. He cultivated a small vegetable garden for his simple needs. When old Barrett finally died, villagers began a great search for his fortune. A couple of fellows dug up an orange kettle near the cave. It was filled with ancient French coins. However, this was believed to have only been a small part of the main sachet, which is still safe in the ground here at Georgia Stream. The rock-bound coast of Maine, its sweeping beaches, offshore islands, and ragged peninsulas still conceal treasures buried or lost years ago by swatch-bucking pirates and hardy settlers. Tales of these obscure treasures are still being told by rugged characters mending lobster gear on the decaying wharf. Folks up there continue to search for buried pirate gold in lonely coves and on shadowy islands, often lacing their stories with high faith in spooks ghosts, and spirits. If you are ever in the area of the coastal town of Machias, you will hear tales of loot hidden by the notorious pirate, Captain Rhodes. He roamed this shore in 1675, using the sheltered inlet of the Machias River as a hideout in place of careening his ship. Another Machias area treasure is also stashed along Starbirds Creek. Years ago, Captain Harry Thompson and another buccaneer named Starbirds frequently used the entrance of the Machias River as a rendezvous between voyages. As a consequence, they used a nearby creek named Starbird to sachet their plunder. Thompson was said to have marked some trees and to have drawn a crude map to aid his children in locating this trove. But they apparently misinterpreted the clues for they dug without success. In the same general area, Brothers Island, named for two brothers called Flynn, is reputedly to be the hiding place of their trove. However, information concerning this such age is not easy to establish. Dixie Bull, an English sea captain descended from an aristocratic family, was the first pirate known to prey on shipping off the northeastern colonies, especially along the rocky coastline of Maine. Some of his hidden hordes have contributed to the traditions of pirates and buried treasures along the New England coast. One of his treasures was reputed to be worth $400,000 at the time of its burial on Dharma's Cove Island. If found today, its value could be worth 10 times that amount. Another of his hoards is supposed to have been buried on Cushing Island, also off the coast of Maine. Neither trove is known to have been recovered. Bull was a native of London who came to Boston in 1631. He rapidly adopted to the rugged life of the New England wilderness, becoming a trader in beaver pelts with the Indians. In June of 1632, while trading in the Pemscott Bay area, Bull was attacked by a roving band of Frenchmen in a pinnace or small sailing ship. They seized his sloop and stock of coats, rugs, blankets, biscuits, etc., this same band captured the Plymouth Company's coastline trading post, which was filled with other valuable loot. Trader Bull, fired by a desire for revenge, assembled 20 men to prey upon the French shipping in an effort to recover his loss. Their attempts were unsuccessful, for the French had temporarily ceased their raids. Bull's food and supplies were running low, so he attacked and plundered three small English vessels in order to keep operating. These attacks put him in serious trouble with the crown, and he became desperate. His next escapade was later in 1632, when he fell into the harbor of Pemaquid, sacked the trading post and nearby dwellings, and escaped with $2,500 in booty. There was little resistance to the attack, but while loading goods aboard his sloop, someone on shore, 40 musket, and bull second in command was struck in the chest. He toppled over dead upon the deck. Until then, many of his crew had considered piracy a lark. It suddenly became deadly serious business. Having been treated freebooters by circumstance, Dixie Bull and his men raided isolated settlements and attacked small vessels until November. 
At that time, the Boston government dispatched five sloops and pinnacles under Samuel Maverick to capture Bull. The small fleet cruised off the main coast for several weeks, but eventually returned to Boston unsuccessful. Early in February of 1633, three of Bull's men secretly returned to their main home. They said he had sailed eastward and joined the French, his former enemy. Another statement by Captain Roger Clapp indicated that Bull eventually returned to England. His destiny is lost in the maze of history. One version says that he was finally captured and hung at Tyburn, England. Bull's fate will probably never be known. The fate of his buried treasure on Cushion or Camas Cove Island may be determined by a skillful treasure hunter. Good luck while treasure hunting in Maine.